Hi, welcome back to the channel. I'm Michelle and today I want to share with you my faith journey. On this channel I talk pretty openly about my beliefs. If you're new here, I am a Lutheran, specifically the ELCA denomination, so that's a form of Christianity. And I've talked about how we, in my, our household, look into other traditions, religious beliefs. We're very open in this family. But I've never really discussed how I got there, how I went from being raised in a completely non-religious household to be married to a pastor. And it's a story that I think is worth telling. I think people's faith journeys are often full of struggle and it can make difficult talking about those things so openly with strangers, pretty much. But I still think the overall faith journey is worth talking about on this platform. I think you get a lot of views of Christianity and my view is just as valid as everyone else's, so I will start with, I think when you talk about your faith journey, you really need to talk about your parents' faith because I think it greatly influences your faith growing up. And that can be, if even if your parents are completely secular, non-religious, they have certain biases. Everybody has biases and are influenced by the things around them. So I don't really think there's a neutral perspective when it comes to that. We're greatly influenced by our environment, our surroundings, the things we know. So I'm going to specifically refer to my mother's religious upbringing in this because my parents divorced when I was very little and my mother was a single mother for the majority of my life. So <laughs> I will specifically just be referring to her religious background. So my mother grew up in a conservative Christian household. It was a very fire and brimstone type God. If you got in trouble, you sat in a corner and read your Bible. Very, if you did something wrong, God was punishing you or trying to teach you something. So that's the environment she grew up in. And I, obviously my mother was not comfortable with that environment. And when she became an adult, she chose not to be a practicing Christian at all. She, when she had children, she chose not to raise us in a religious, specific religion or religious household because she had such a negative experience growing up and the way she viewed things, she didn't want us to see the world like that. She wanted us to grow up and make our own choices about our religious beliefs, which I really respect as a parent. But my mother also went into life having some of those biases. Even though she wasn't practicing religion, they were very ingrained in her. She was a very firm believer that you get what's coming to you type thing, that if God is just trying to teach you a lesson, even though she, was, she wasn't practicing in any way, she still had those beliefs ingrained in her. My mother did not believe in things like interracial dating. She did not believe in the gay community, anything like that. It was a very, that's okay for other people, but not in our house. And a lot of that stemmed from her religious upbringing. My mother was a very loving person, don't get me wrong, but a lot of that formed her perspective on life. So as a child, I didn't have any real exposure to religion. My grandmother did attend church on a regular basis, but again, we didn't live near her, so it wasn't something that I was around a lot. I would say my first religious experience was one thing I do remember from being very young. I was probably seven, six or seven at the time, but we were visiting my grandmother, and I did go to church with her. And my Grandmother was part of the Missouri Senate, which is a conservative Christian group. And I remember sitting through church with her and it came time for communion. And my grandmother turns to me and she says, this isn't for you, you have to stay here. And I remember thinking, I'm not welcome. And that was my first real experience with any type of religion is not being welcome, that this is for certain people and not for me. And I want you to hold on to that thought because it definitely comes up later in my journey a couple times actually. But that was my first experience was being unwelcome. 
So you can understand at a young age, I wasn't too keen on church. But when I went to high school, it was in Wisconsin, and it was a very small, conservative town. Pretty much the entire population was some form of Christianity, mostly conservative. There was nothing else. And that I did have some friends who had, uh, that, you know, had Christian beliefs, and some more conservative, some not. It wasn't until I went to college, I went to a liberal arts college, which part of that is you have to take certain humanities classes in order to get your degree. And one of the classes required was an introduction to world religions. So that was one of my first experiences with religion. And it was interesting because I came from a perspective of not being raised religious in any way, but still being raised in an environment that had some of those religious foundations in it from my mother's experience. So I went into learning about Buddhism, East Asian religions, Judaism, Christianity as well, but learning about all these different forms of worship, you know, and learning all these different religious ideas and beliefs, it gives me a deep understanding and respect for these other beliefs. Although I personally don't adhere to them, I understand a lot of where their beliefs stem from, how it is part of their culture. And I think that gives me the ability to see others equally in that way, that I'm not right and you're wrong. It's not that black and white. There's this paradoxical thought that it can, we can both be right. And I think it's interesting while studying these how you learn that there, there's a lot of common things major religions have, right? They all have, answer the big questions like, where did we come from? How do we live our lives? What happens after we die? Those are all main questions that all religions seek to answer. And although some of them may be different, yes, we still have common ground to come from. And it was really interesting, and it was so interesting, the fact that I continued to take classes past the acquired ones, because like I've said in previous videos, your religious beliefs are so tied into your cultural beliefs and your way of life that it, you're really learning more, not just about a specific person's beliefs, but about an entire culture. I found it fascinating. So I continued to take more and more classes. I took Judaism classes, I took um, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, all those classes just because I found it was so interesting. I actually was very close to minoring in religion. <laughs> if you're curious, my major is business and marketing. But it was interesting because I was able to freely explore these ideas with nobody telling me they were wrong, no one telling me that this is right and this is wrong but to really explore my own spirituality for the first time in my life, especially becoming an adult and being able to make my own choices and really coming into who I was as well as learning who I was spiritually. Now, it was, I was 19, so I was a sophomore in, sophomore in college when I met my now husband. Um, I met him through a mutual fan, friend and we had talked and he seemed really funny and I remember on our first date, I, I talked to him about, you know, what our majors are, you know, the normal talk. And he told me his major was religion. I thought, oh, that was really interesting because I enjoy reading about religion and different things like that and the history of it. And I asked him, well, what do you plan on doing with a major like that? And he told me he plans on going to seminary to be a pastor. <laughs> I literally laughed in his face because I thought he was joking. Because to me, I was like, who would want that job? I, it just did not seem appealing to me at all. And he seemed like such a normal person. Again, a lot of the Christian people I've encountered in my life prior to this were very conservative, very <sighs> close-minded. And this is not the person I was talking to. He's very open and cared deeply for other people and was supportive of things like LGBTQ and I was just really surprised that this person in front of me who was telling me they were going to dedicate their life to God was so open and honest and nothing like I had seen in, Christ in people calling themselves Christian prior to this. So it was, it was different and 
obviously we continued to date and eventually got married, but what I really appreciate about my husband was that he allowed me the space to really discover my own spirituality. He never pushed his beliefs on me. He never st steered me a certain way. He never made me feel dumb for my questions because it is sometimes nice to have like a person with a master's of divinities. You can ask all these questions when you're learning about religions, but he never told me or made me feel like I had to be a certain way or believe a certain thing, which was amazing. And I think it really helped me grow spiritually as a person, having someone that was so open and honest. So we continued to date through my entire undergraduate. Um, by the, my junior year, my husband was in seminary. We obviously weren't married at that point. He went to seminary. He went to five years of seminary. So we had a long distance relationship for about three years. I would obviously visit my husband in seminary and it was a very interesting experience because again, I'm this person coming into faith and learning about different beliefs and different pathways. And here, when I would visit my husband at seminary, these are people who are intensely devoting their lives to God. These are the Christians that are like hardcore, <laughs> very, deep spiritual beliefs. And I just, I wasn't one of those people. I was not that type of person. And I was a rarity because most of these people came from very religious families or backgrounds. And there was a mixture of all different types of Christianity, conservative, progressive, all that. It wasn't like you're only taught this one particular view of Christianity. But it was interesting being immersed in people that were very far on their faith journeys already. That was just in the beginning. And I remember one of the things my husband had to do is he had something called ministry in context, which is kind of like um, an internship for pastors. So he, for six months, he worked in a church in the south side of Chicago and kind of learned under the pastor there and he would practice preaching and all the things the pastors do. And uh, it was interesting because this was one of my first real experiences in a church since I was young. And I remember going to church a couple times with my husband, my you know boyfriend at the time. And whenever it came time for communion, I would stay in my seat. Because remember, if you remember back when I was younger, I was told I was not welcome because I was not a part of that church. I was not baptized. I was not welcome to take part in that. And after a few Sundays, I remember the pastor came up to me and he's like, why don't you take communion? And I said, well, I was taught that because I'm not a member of church and I'm not baptized, I'm not able to take communion. And he looked at me and he said, don't let anyone ever tell you that you're not welcome at the Lord's table. <laughs> and that does get emotional for me because it was the first time I was welcome in a church. And he said, it, you know, it doesn't matter. All, everybody's welcome at the Lord's table. So that was my first really positive experience in church. And I would often, and what I loved about this church is it wasn't just you go, you listen to a sermon, you go home. It was an experience. It was like a four hour long experience where you know, the church my grandmother went to was where you sit there, you're quiet, you don't say anything. They would be getting up and singing and it was an experience. You could, not, you could feel people actually feeling the words that were being said and afterwards there'd be a big, pretty much feast. Like there'd be so much food and then there'd be Bible study. And I remember I would, enjoy, I would join these Bible studies many times because my husband or boyfriend at the time was busy doing his pastor stuff. <laughs> um, so I would join and I remember one of the things we were talking about was the Good Samaritan. And especially living in Chicago, that's where my husband went to seminary, you do encounter a lot of homeless people. And one of the things brought up is, well, what do you do when they approach you and ask for something? And a lot of people in the Bible study said, you know, I don't give them money because, you know, they're just going to go buy drugs or alcohol with it. 
And I remember this very elderly woman said, you know, it's not our job to judge what they do with the money. Our, it, what we're being called to do is to help one another, to love one another. It doesn't matter what they do with the money or the food that you give them. You're called to help, not to judge. And that really stuck with me, and that stuck with me till today. Again, this was, I'm starting to see these people who call themselves Christians that aren't judgmental, that aren't using scripture to promote hatred or bigotry, which is a lot of what I had experienced with Christianity before. And I think this is one of the reasons of making this video, that there's so much out there within Christianity that sometimes, unfortunately, the loudest voices you hear are those conservative types and that's not what Christianity is. And don't get me wrong, I, on this channel I've been told many times that I'm not a real Christian because I don't believe a certain way or I don't do things a certain way. And the funny thing is, nobody gets to tell you what your relationship with God and Jesus is. That is something between you and Jesus. Nobody gets to tell you how it's going to go. So again, I was being experienced with these different things. My husband eventually did become ordained as a pastor and we got married and he got his first call, ended up on our first congregation. And again, it was interesting going into this because I was now a pastor's wife. <laughs> I did not have what I would say a firm belief at this point. Like I had all these ideas and thoughts and things I had read, but I had not really cultivated my relationship with God yet. And going in as a pastor's wife, it was it was it was brand new to me because people expect me. Again, I have a video on my channel, check it out, where people make assumptions about pastors' wives. And a lot of these things just weren't true of me. I'm not conservative. I'm not a lot of those things. So check out that video. But learning to be the pastor's wife and to be myself at the same time. And I have to say, we've been, my husband's been part of three different congregations. We're in a third call right now. And we've had some really negative experiences in churches. We've had some really positive experiences in churches. I think being married to the pastor gives you a very unique perspective of both sides. You see the normal side of church as congregational members see, but you also see the underside of it, the sometimes darker side of churches where you meet some of, honestly, some of the worst people I've ever met in my life have people who regularly attend church. People who, again, use the scripture as a means to spread hatred and bigotry, which I don't understand because that is the exact opposite of what Jesus stood for. Jesus literally was hanging out with the marginalized, and ostracized, he was breaking down walls and beliefs, and he was this radical thinker, yet here are people twisting his words to make an excuse for their own bias. So again, we, we experienced some of this, we've experienced people who believe that because their money or their family donates a lot of money that they own the church and they get to make the rules. So again, I've seen a lot of both sides. I've seen how much stress and hard work being a pastor is. A lot of people think that pastors just work on Sundays and that's just not true. You know, I can't imagine when somebody is dying or going through something difficult and my husband gets the phone call to go and he goes, most people don't want to walk in a room where that thing is happening. No, most people don't want to sit there and hold somebody's hand while they're dying. And this is what he chooses to do with his life. And it's very admirable, but very hard and stressful. And as you can imagine, very emotionally and physically exhausting for a person to do, to take on spiritually leading other people. So it was interesting to see someone so impassioned and truly caring for others, calling and calling themselves a Christian, spreading the love of Jesus, not the hate of Jesus, which Jesus, again, was never about. So it was interesting kind of watching all these things happen. But one of the things that I think really 
solidified my path, spiritual path was um, up until this point in my life, I had definitely, I would say, again, we'd experienced negative things, but nothing I would say that was earth shattering, nothing that shook me to the core. But the thing that did happen that ultimately did that is when we were finished, my husband was finishing up seminary, um, we decided to get pregnant. And I did get pregnant, but shortly after my pregnancy test, I ended up miscarrying. And this was the first experience I had in my life that ever really shook me to the core. I had lost loved ones in the past, but again, it was, you know, great grandparents, things like that. I had never really been faced with tackling what I truly believed. And I was very naive going into my first pregnancy thinking, again, some of that mindset that my mother had that you, you get what you deserve and if something happens, God's trying to teach you something. So I was very confused about why this was happening to me. I mean, my husband's literally dedicating his life to God and Jesus, and here I am, and this horrible thing is happening to me. And it definitely caused a change in me. I started looking for these answers because I couldn't believe that something so horrible would be caused by someone. There's nothing to learn from this lesson. It was just really painful. And I didn't want to go to a place where I blamed God for what was going on with me. So I started reading again a lot. I'm not sure how I came across this book. I will insert a picture of it, but it really helped me. And if you're someone that is struggling, going through something difficult and wondering where Jesus and or God is in those struggles, I highly recommend this book. So, it's called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People by Harold Kushner. Now, Harold Kushner is a rabbi, and he talks in the book about his own personal experience about having a child born with a condition where they would eventually die, and how he struggled with his spiritual journey, about how he, as a man of God, how he came to terms with this. And, also, and again, the book is wonderful. I highly recommend it. It talks about how God is not responsible for the horrible things that happen in the world. That bad things just happen. That's just the way things are. Like we adhere to the laws of science and physics and things happen. There's no puppeteer up there controlling everything, which I get why some people like that mindset that if something horrible happens, sometimes it's easier to deal with if it has a reason, if you have a lesson to learn, if there is a greater purpose, there's comfort in that. But there's also, I think, despair in thinking that this greater being is punishing you to try to teach you something. What he talks about pretty much in the book is that things happen. You know, with free will, we make choices in life. There's no predestination. Things happen, and sometimes they're horrible and sad. And Jesus is not the cause of those things, but he's there with you during those horrible things. You're not alone. He's there with you during the wonderful moments in life as well. But I think we reach for Jesus most when we're struggling. We need, you know, to lean on Jesus. So he's there while you're breaking down crying. He's there holding your hand. And this message of pure unconditional love I think is so important because again so much of what you hear about Christianity those loud voices is the hatred and the fire and the brimstone and it's not Jesus is all about unconditional love there's nothing you can do that would stop Jesus from loving you that is a profound statement and I really want you to think about that because I'm sure there will be negative comments as there always is, but that's not the point. I don't make the video for those people. If this reaches one person that makes them truly think, then that's the point. So I struggled with these emotions and going through this path, ultimately realizing that this wasn't my fault, that 
I'm not alone in this, nobody's doing this to me, it's not some cruel lesson to teach me something, that sometimes sad things happen, but I'm not alone in them. So that was, I definitely would say, a pivotal moment in my spiritual journey, embracing that unconditional love. Yes, I believe in science and evolution and all these things, but I also believe in spirituality. I believe in God. I believe that there are miracles and things like children. For me personally, it was a spiritual thing being able to have children, knowing that the struggles I had, and I, again, I read a lot in the Bible about those struggles. My fav one of my favorite is Job. Harold Kushner in his book talks a lot about Job and there's different translations of Job, different interpretations. And I, I would read um, his recommended things where he pulled sources from, because again, a good book will have sources where they get information. I would read all of the sources he cited. And I just dove deeper and deeper and deeper. And it helped me get out of this dark place in my life. And I'm thankful for that. And it's funny because if you watch any of my update videos, Last year, my mom passed away unexpectedly, and two weeks before she passed away, I had reread that book because I, it was exactly 10 years prior, I had read it for the first time. I reread that book wondering if it was as amazing as I remember, or if it was just, I was going through a difficult time and I found it helpful. And the book was still amazing as it was 10 years later, and I have to say that when my mother passed unexpectedly, that book tremendously helped me again. So that is how I formed my relationship with Jesus. Now, how it is today, I am definitely a strong proponent of speaking about Jesus' unconditional love for us and support of we are, in my beliefs, uh, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we can have different beliefs, different traditions, different ideas, and that's fine. But just like your siblings, you can be completely different but love one another and treat one another with respect. And that's how I approach things. And how it comes, I, I would say, full circle is when I, that original story about when I was not allowed to take communion as a child. Recently in our church, there was a family visiting and we have an area in the back where you can go if kids need a break or a snack. Um, my children do attend in service worship and I think that's a wonderful thing. Anyways, my youngest, my two year old was having a fit. So we went back to get a snack and he was gonna play with some Legos they had over there. And then another mother, their child was probably five or six, came back and her son was visibly distraught and upset. And I went over and I said, you know, we have snacks over here. We have some um, toys if he needs a break. Because again, this is, you know, behind the worship, you could still see everything, but there was a glass wall. So, you know, if your child's screaming, it's not as loud. So as a parent, it's helpful. And she said, you know, he's just upset because he can't take communion. And I said, well, why can't he? And she's like, well, he hasn't had um, first communion or any of that. And I don't know the church rules. And I said, anybody is welcome to take communion at this church. My children, my nine, five, and two-year-old take communion as soon as they're old enough to reach for it. And that's my husband's philosophy with it. If somebody wants it, you give it to them. Just like that pastor told me a long time ago, all are welcome at the Lord's table. So I, I explained this to her that, you know, you're welcome to take communion and the the little boy's face just got so happy and he went down and he got in line he got his communion and it was just joy it was joy and to me that's what jesus is about that is what my christian belief is about that all are welcome unconditional love that and i make a point that whatever church we are in that in the bulletin that you read for the service that it states in there that all are welcome at the Lord's table. My husband always makes the announcement before communion, all are welcome at the Lord's table because I think one of the worst things we can do is tell people when they first come to into a church that this isn't for you because I experienced that at a young age and it very 
It negatively affected me in my relationship with God. So that is my ultimate message, my ultimate, and this journey is not over. My spiritual journey will continue and grow because I think it should. Spiritually, we should be growing as people. We don't get stuck on one belief and leave it at that. We grow, we learn, we embrace one another. So that is where I am now. And I'm using what resources I have to promote a Christian idea of love, unconditional love, to embrace one another, to respect and understand one another, to accept one another. So if you have any questions, leave them down below. Uh, thank you for watching.